The other lot will assign the goat for Azazel. <laughs> Who's this? Azazel. It's a wonderful question, John. And scholars have wondered for quite some time, like, what, what in the world is going on here? Azazel was, was a demon. But most Hebrew scholars today understand Azazel as a proper name. The name of a demon that inhabits the desert, the wilderness. The Bible asks us to believe a lot of strange things about the spiritual world. At first, we might be tempted to ignore them, but if we say we believe the Bible, we can't avoid these concepts. Much of what we think we know about the spirit world isn't true. It's been filtered down through centuries of church tradition. Angels do not have wings. Demons don't have horns or tails. And for the biblical writers, the unseen realm was home to more than angels and demons. There were other, bigger players. So do you believe what's in your Bible? Something is wrong in the world because we're all dying. Yeah. And why are we dying? And so ritual impurity reminds me that I'm not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we're not in Eden. And so it is in that way associated with sin yeah. and the failure to live by God's commands and wisdom. So this all leads up to a need to resolve this crisis. And what did happen on the eighth day? Oh, yeah. Rebellion, the introduction of death into Yahweh's living room. So the Day of Atonement is revealed to Aaron and Moses on the day that death was introduced into the tent. Mm. This is similar to how in the Garden of Eden, even his act of severity of exiling them and telling them, you're going to live outside Eden, you're going to die now, is laced with mercy and a promise of, of the snake-crushing seed of the woman. So here, his words to Moses and Aaron on the day of the rebellion of Aaron's sons is laced with the promise. You're talking about when Adam and Eve, when he comes to tell them like death has come. Yeah. This is Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three. Yeah. Yeah. You just authored your own deaths. You're now slaves to the earth. Mm -hmm. Like this is bad. Yes. Right in there. God also promises that a seed of the woman, meaning a future child. A child. Yeah. Will be someone who will crush the snake. And mm -hmm. the snake is the one that caused Adam and Eve yes. to corrupt. Yep. And so God promises a solution. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a human yeah. who's going to yeah. crush undo, the snake. Yeah, undo what the snake has done. And while crushing the snake, being bit by the snake. Being bit, yeah. The victory and rescue will happen through one who also dies. Yeah. And that's a little riddle. Yeah that begins to be unpacked in every cycle of the melody through, as you go throughout the rest of the Hebrew Bible. And we're looking at another one right here. Mm. The failure of the two sons of Aaron in the Eden tent, introducing death into the tent, is now linked to all these laws about the spreading of impurity through the camp. But God wants to provide for it by washing and purifying through the blood of a blameless substitute. And that all leads up to the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16 and verse 8. Again, we're familiar with the fact that Aaron is told to pick two goats and that cast lots over the two goats. So we've got two goats. Aaron casts lots over them. One of the goats, again, if you did the reading for today, you're, this is going to be familiar. Or if you just read Leviticus 16, one lot falls on a goat, and then that goat is for the Lord, for Yahweh. The Hebrew is the, I have in yellow here, the preposition Lamed plus the name Yahweh, Ladonai. The other goat is Lamed, and then another name. This goat is for Azazel. And scholars have wondered for quite some time, like, what, what in the world is going on here? Azazel was, was a demon, not just in later Judaism, 
but he is a he is a deity, you know, to, to an Israelite mind, demonic figure of the wilderness. He's a wilderness entity, a god, a deity associated with the wilderness. He's not Yahweh. Wow. I hope you guys are enjoying this series as much as I am. Atonement is a super important topic for us as Christians to be able to understand and to get it from the Bible on its own terms. And these scholars are doing a great job. I hope you guys are enjoying the channel. I want to take a moment and ask for you to subscribe. We're growing rapidly, and I am so grateful for the reach that God's given this channel, but I want it to continue to grow so we can help get this message out about the good news about what God's done for this world and the hope that we have in Jesus. So if you could take just a quick minute, it's only a second to you, but to me it means a lot, just press the subscribe button for us. Click on that and uh, follow us. You're going to have a lot of great content coming out in the future and a lot of great content to check out in the past. So just wanted to pause and say thank you guys. For all that you're doing for this channel and please subscribe the lord said to moses speak to your brother aaron so that he won't enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the atonement lid which is on the ark or he will die Oh, so now the high priest might die. Yeah. By even going in. Yeah. And why would he die? Because I will appear in the cloud over the atonement lid. This is how Aaron will enter the holy place. One, with a bowl for a purification offering. Second, with a ram for a ascension or going up offering. And um, your translation is probably going to say sin offering. Correct. You called it a purification offering. That's right. And we talked about that during yeah. the offerings. That's right. Sin offering is a mm -hmm. translation of a word that doesn't mm -hmm. mean sin, right? It yeah, it is spelled with the same Hebrew root letters as the word sin. Okay. But when it's put into a certain verb form for Hebrew nerds, it's the PL. The meaning of that verbal form is to purify from sin. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's a purification from sin offering. Mm -hmm. And that's what you use it for. You use it to sprinkle the blood mm -hmm. to purify Correct. The space. That's right. Yeah. Yep. So this is all standard stuff yeah. that you know already if you've been tracking with Leviticus so far. So you expect him to bring in a purification offering. You expect yeah. him to come with an ascension offering. Okay. Next, he's going to put on a holy linen tunic. Mm, he's going to take off his standard gear. Oh, so this is a different gear. Yeah. Oh. He's just going to wear a very simple, thin, white linen tunic and thin, light, white linen underwear. Mm. So none of the fancy stuff. Okay. The crown, because it goes off. Breastplate. It's really interesting. Okay. This, and this is where he goes in, to the most holy place. You would right. expect him to have it on. Him off. Most interpreters through history see this as the one day that he does go directly before Yahweh, he goes in in a humble state. Mm. The rest of the time, when he's out more visible yeah. to people outside, he would look like a god, an image of God. Mm -hmm. But when he goes in before Yahweh, he goes in in a humble state. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So before he goes in, he shall go through the waters, bathe his body, and then put on the clothes. Now, here's the unique thing about this day. So after the waters, he takes from all the Israelites two goats for a purification offering and another ram for an ascension offering. So he's going to take the two goats and present them before Yahweh at the tent of meeting, and he's going to get out dice. Dice. <laughs> he shall cast lots for the two goats. That's dice? Ancient dice. Yeah. Some sort of little, I mean, they're not described in great detail, but the goral. It's a randomizer. Yeah. The lot. Usually they're called casting lots, but it's rolling ancient dice. And the dice will determine the fate of these goats. One lot will assign the goat for Yahweh. The other lot will assign the goat for Azazel. <laughs> Who's this? Azazel. It's a wonderful question, John. Think about it. While Israel was traveling to the Promised Land, they were not yet in Yahweh's portion of the earth. Laws about sacred space taught Israelites that Yahweh's people were sacred. Their home was sacred. 
and that other nations were estranged from God. If the Israelite camp in the wilderness was considered holy, outside the camp was unholy ground. The annual Day of Atonement ceremony illustrated this point. Two goats were involved in the ceremony. One goat was sacrificed, but one was not. The one sacrificed was for the Lord. The one left alive was for Azazel. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Yahweh and one for Azazel. But he must present alive before Yahweh the goat on which the lot for Azazel fell to make atonement for himself, to send it away into the desert to Azazel. Azazel was, was a demon, not just in later Judaism, but he is a he is a deity, you know, to to an Israelite mind, demonic figure of the wilderness. He's a wilderness entity, a god, a deity associated with the wilderness. He's not Yahweh. The wilderness is his domain. It's the bad place. It's the anti Eden. The wilderness is not where Yahweh is. Yahweh is leading us through the wilderness to his land, to the land he is giving us, to the new Eden, the land that flows with milk and honey. But we're here in the wilderness and we have these instructions for Leviticus 16 and we have these two goats. One of them is for Yahweh, the other one is for Azazel. Now this has raised the question, well, is this a sacrifice? Like, do you, have, do you have God, like, telling the Israelites to sacrifice a goat to a, a, a different God? No. If you actually look through and read Leviticus 16, only one of the goats is sacrificed. I mean, there's one goat that is sacrificed, before I get there, there's one goat that is sacrificed to Yahweh. The blood of that goat is applied to the structure of the tabernacle. It's sprinkled on the mercy seat where the Ark of the Covenant is. It's, this is the Day of Atonement. It actually has nothing to do with the forgiveness of any individual sins. What this does, and again, we did a whole podcast series on the book of Leviticus. You can listen to Leviticus 16, and really Leviticus 1 through about 7, the, you know, the sacrifice is there. The blood is never applied to people. There are only two exceptions where blood is applied to people. And they have to do with the priesthood, sanctifying the priesthood, because they will occupy sacred space and perform various rituals to protect Yahweh's turf, to protect sacred space from defilement, and again, allow access to worshipers and people who bring offerings. The, the offerings are consistently about purging, cleansing sacred space so that the people are accepted into sacred space or at least onto some part of sacred space to bring their offering, regardless of whatever kind of offering it is. So the blood of the one goat is applied to the tabernacle itself. Uh, I, like to, I like to compare the Day of Atonement to hitting the reboot button on your computer because that's exactly what it did. It resets the tabernacle. You did this once a year. It resets the tabernacle to its original pristine conditions so that it can be used for another year. It, it's a reboot. It's a, it's a, it's a do-over. It's a, it's a renewal of the starting point. It's about sacred space. It's not about people. The blood is never applied to people. Now, the second goat, what is that? That is not sacrificed. We don't have an offering, you know, sacrificed to some foreign god. What the priest does with it is he lays his hands on the head of the second goat and he symbolically transfers the sins, the impurities, everything that would defile sacred space and be an offense to Yahweh is transferred to the head of the goat. And then the goat is sent off where? Into the wilderness to Azazel. What's the logic? 
Well, this is where sin belongs. This is where impurity belongs. It doesn't belong in the camp of Yahweh. I mean, much less sacred space. I mean, it, it doesn't belong anywhere here in Yahweh's people because Yahweh's people themselves are sanctified. They are set apart from other peoples. I mean, they're not, you know, to worship other gods, obviously, but they're not even, they even have their own land, okay? They're, they're completely separated. They're to be a kingdom of priests and a holy, a set apart nation. So once a year, we're going to hit the reboot button and we're going to send all of the impurities, all the things that are anti-Eden back to anti-Eden. Because Eden, you know, the, the, the camp, the, the holy company, the holy family in God's domain needs to be purified. And we reset the tabernacle so that as we go, and people become ritually impure by, you know, maybe they touch a dead carcass or a woman in her menstrual cycle. I mean, we, we could talk about all these things, what the logic is. None of them have to do, none of those things have to do with moral failure or moral impurities. They're not sins, okay? What they are is there are things that happen to people that render them ritually impure. And all the things in the Levitical system that render someone ritually impure are things that are unavoidable in life. They're not designed to teach the Israelites anything about how awful they are. They're designed to teach the Israelites how human they are and how other non-human, how above human God is. This is the point. This is the logic of the system. You know, we, we've sort of read New Testament forgiveness and sacrifice of, of Jesus terminology back into the Old Testament, and therefore we don't understand what's going on here. What we should do is understand what's going on here and then read that into New Testament material. That is, typically isn't what happens. We do the reverse, and it creates a lot of confusion. You know, this isn't a, a class session on the priesthood and the sacrificial system, but again, we're, we're getting into this a little bit here, just in, the, in sort of the most dramatic example here with the Day of Atonement. You put impurity and sin and defilement, you know, and whatever label you want to put on it, everything that is anti-Eden, you cleanse the sacred space, you, you reboot the community, and you take all that stuff that is incompatible with the presence of God, and you put it out there because that's where it belongs. All of our English translations, no, not all, wonderful. NIV translates the word Azazel as for the scapegoat. One lot for Yahweh, the other lot for the scapegoat. Now, even that English phrasing is a little bit odd. For the scapegoat? Yeah, instead of as the scapegoat? Yeah, it makes you sound like this goat is being sent for some On other. On behalf of. For some other thing yeah. named the scapegoat. And actually, the oddity is the problem at the heart of the NIV's interpretation here. Um, the New American Standard also translates it as scapegoat. So does King James. But the ESV transliterates the word Azazel with a capital A. Yeah. One lot for Yahweh, one lot for Azazel. Like it's a name of something. Yeah. And the NRSV does that as well. Why do they do that? Well... So notice the parallelism of verse 8. It's almost like a poetic line. Aaron will cast lots for two goats, one lot for Yahweh, the other lot for Azazel. So the sentence structure leads you to think that each lot will designate each goat for someone. The first lot's for someone, and then the way the Hebrews phrased for Azazel puts it in a parallel slot as if it's a name or a title of some kind. Mm. And then we'll just keep reading. Then Aaron will offer the goat on which is the lot for Yahweh fell and make it a purification offering. And the goat on which the lot for Uzazel fell shall be presented alive before Yahweh to make atonement for it, to send it to Uzazel into the wilderness. So there's two ways this has been translated throughout history, two main ways. There 
is ample evidence that the earliest interpreters of Leviticus understood this as the name of a spiritual being. So I'm just looking here at the Hebrew Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament by Kohler and Baumgartner, and their first kind of main entry here is a demon of the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Lots of scholarly history to that. The etymology, like what's the Hebrew root for the name, is, they say, uncertain. However, there has been an explanation offered by a, a Semitic scholar, Nicholas Wyatt, who thinks it derives from two roots. One is the word azaz in Hebrew, which means strong, and the other one is el, which means spiritual being, powerful spiritual being. <laughs> There's Azel, who resides in the wilderness. Hmm. The scapegoat interpretation, you really have to do some legwork here. This is also an ancient interpretation. Actually, it gets really complicated into Semitic philology, nerdiness stuff. But there are some people who think it's related to an Arabic cognate word, uh, which means to remove, and that it's a shorthand, the goat for removal. I'm compelled by the parallelism multiple times that these are both names or titles for the one to whom it is sent. So here's the next thing that is interesting. These two goats are unique. This is like a unique ritual that only happens on this day. So none of the other offerings involve anything like what's happening with these two goats. The second thing is the two goats are presented together as a singular offering. And there's no other offering that's quite like this. Mm -hmm. So it makes clear what's true for all the others, that they are symbolic rituals. They tell a story. So you have to ask yourself, what story would be told by a singular offering made up of two animals, one of whom gives its life as a blameless substitute and is killed, and its life is brought in before Yahweh. And we're familiar with that from the other offerings. But then this other one doesn't die immediately, at least. It remains alive. You haven't told the story yet of what happens to these goats. Yeah, totally. So let us, let us do that. So first, the goat that is for Yahweh. He shall slaughter the goat of the purification offering that's for the people. And he will bring its blood inside the veil. Inside the holy place. Yeah. The holy of holies. And this is it. This is like the time that he goes in once a year. He will do with its blood as he did with the blood of a bull. He will sprinkle it right on the atonement lid, mm. on the mercy seat. And he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. So he will do this for the tent of meeting that dwells in the middle of them, in the middle of their impurities. So right here in verse 16, and this is kind of an easy way to remember it because it's chapter 16. 1616 tells you the meaning. We're going to link together the last many episodes of conversations here, but this is a culminating moment in the book so far. Atonement is used in two ways. And uh, the Hebrew Bible scholar here that I've learned the most from is Jay Sklar, uh, his book, Impurity and Sin and Atonement in Ancient Israel. That's not the precise title, but we'll put a link in the show notes to this book. Is that atonement is used in two ways related to the two main meanings of its root word. One is to provide a ransom. When you wrong someone, you owe them. And so it, when we wrong each other, we wrong God. That's core to this idea. And so we owe God for wronging each other. And so a blameless life being offered unfairly to give its life for my sins is a ransom. But then also um, another metaphorical kind of scheme is that my sins and impurities pollute the divine presence like that encroaching waves of ickiness. <laughs> and so that blood can overpower the forces of death by standing in my place as a blameless substitute where life, a blameless life, can cover over death and sin. Both stories are being told right here in Leviticus 16, 16. And this goat, which is only one half of the Day of Atonement offering, remember this, the purification offering, singular, is happening through two animals. So then he comes out, and he comes to that goat that's alive, and he puts the two hands 
and he presses them down on the head of that goat that's alive. And he confesses over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel, all their transgressions and all their sins. Those are the three bad words. Yeah. We made a video series about each one of them. There's a variety of ways of describing human failure. There's all three. Then he will place them on the head of the goat. Now there's good symbolic language for you. Mm -hmm. Put the sin on the goat. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, somehow. Somehow. Then what he does is send it into the wilderness by the hand of a man of my time. A man of the time, a man of appointing. That's a whole rabbit hole. We don't have time to go down there. Someone, but someone will send him up. And that goat will carry upon itself the iniquities of Israel to a land that is cut off. Hmm. And he will send the goat into the wilderness. The sins are exiled. Yeah. So the Holy of Holies represents like the Eden tree of life center. And the one goat goes in there. The blameless goat goes in there. The living goat goes out into the wilderness to a cutoff land, the opposite end of the cosmos in the biblical imagination. So scholars call this the elimination ritual. And I uh, learned a lot about this from reading lots of scholars. One particularly illuminating account for this ritual was a scholar named Roy Gain in his book, Cult and Character. It's a whole book about purification offerings in the Day of Atonement (laughs) and the problem of evil Hmm. in the Hebrew Bible. So I'm just going to talk through this kind of extended quote, but this was hugely illuminating for me. And he says, no part of this goat, the living goat, is offered to Yahweh. This is not a sacrifice. Hmm. It's an elimination ritual. The biblical prescription does not call for the death of this goat. It is simply sent away as a ritual garbage truck. (laughs) carrying controlled toxic waste to Azazel. Now, Azazel's precise nature is elusive. (laughs) The common understanding of Azazel as a scapegoat, referring to the goat itself, is ruled out by the fact that the animal is sent to Azazel. Right. You could even sniff that out. Yeah. In reading the NIV. Right. Yeah. So obviously the goat could not be sent to the scapegoat. The reason for the lot ritual before Yahweh is that he must decide the role of the goats through what appears to be chance. Hmm. Through the lot ceremonies, the goats are designated as belonging to Yahweh and to Azazel, respectively, each being a party capable of ownership. The fact that Yahweh is a supernatural being could be taken to imply that Azazel is the same. But the animal is not an offering to Azazel. Rather, the live goat transports Israelite failures to Azazel, who ends up having to take this noxious load. (laughs) The ritual is an unfriendly gesture to Uh, Azazel. You know what it makes me think of? (laughs) Yeah, go ahead. Do you know that prank where you take poop and put it in a paper bag and then light it on fire and then leave it on someone's doorstep and ring the doorbell? Oh, wow. Never. (laughs) Never. I think I've seen it in a movie or something. Okay, and yeah, you yeah. Rumors of that prank. Wow, kind of feels like that. Well, okay. Uh, here, let me finish. <laughs> it it kind of is like that, but it's also different. Okay. <laughs> and, but Roy Gain will continue because this is great. He said it's more like sending someone a load of chemical or nuclear waste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because it's Yahweh who commands the priest to perform the ritual. It appears that Azazel is his enemy. Hmm. It's likely, therefore, that Azazel is some kind of spiritual being that his presence in the desert regions is the extreme opposite of God's holy presence in the Holy of Holies. However, the nature of Azazel's personality is not revealed in Leviticus, likely to avoid the danger that some might be tempted to honor him. Hmm. So this is more like, this is the snake. It's a name for the snake. Mm. If the mosaic of the messianic deliverer in the Hebrew Bible is truly a mosaic, they're a second Adam, they're like a king from the line of Judah. They're like the high priest. They're like the prophet, like Moses, right? And the Hebrew Bible gives you all these characters to create a mosaic. And the same is true for the mysterious one Jesus called the evil one. Yeah. Lucifer. Uh Uh-huh. That is one name in the Latin translation The Latin tradition. tradition. But the biblical images are the slanderer, the snake, 
the slander is where we get Satan, right? Or is that something um, else? The Satan or the Satan is the one who is opposed. The opposed. The okay. opponent. Yeah. Okay. So Azazel, which very plausibly is a Hebrew compound word meaning powerful spiritual being. The morning star? Yeah, is an image from Isaiah 14. So, but here it's the idea of Azazel is an image of a spiritual being, the non-existent one. Mm. Hmm. I mean, the one who exists, but in a state of chaos and darkness. And so that evil one is the architect behind why we're all outside of Eden. So once a year, we send him a load of BS in a paper bag on fire, <laughs> right? And we send yeah. it out, like yeah. send it back where it came from. Ring the doorbell. It's the elimination ritual. It's so illuminating. Hmm. And both goats together, remember, are a singular purification offering. How do you get that both goats are a singular? When he said, back when he said, take two special goats yeah. for a singular purification offering. Oh, okay. And uniquely, this ritual, the purification happens through two goats. Right. Selected by lots, by Yahweh, right? A man may cast lots, but the decision comes from Yahweh. Mm. That's a proverb. I don't remember <laughs> what chapter it's in. So one is the blameless one who goes in and gives its life for sinful people and its blameless life ransoms them from death and also purifies the pollution of their iniquities. And then the other goat represents Yahweh's desire to do away with the effects of sin and evil once and for all by sending the load of waste back to the one who brought it into the world in the first place. This is the core of the Day of Atonement. So, can we talk about Jesus? <laughs> always. I'm always down to talk about Jesus. So, Jesus is talked about in terms of being an atoning sacrifice. Mm. He, he talked about his own coming death as an atoning sacrifice. Yes. Yeah. And when he does that, he means in probably both senses of purifying the land and also a ransom for mm -hmm. our, our debt obligations. Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting about Jesus is he is bringing together all of the mosaic tiles of depicting God's victory over the evil one and his dealing with the consequences of human sin, and he's merged them all together. The crucifixion of Jesus paralleled the Day of Atonement ceremony. His cross was placed outside the city, away from the temple area, which was holy ground. Jesus bore the sins of the world outside holy ground. The Old Testament leaves clues scattered throughout dozens of places about God's plan, but it doesn't spell it all out in one place. God didn't want the powers of darkness to know the plan. The intelligent supernatural evil beings knew that the prophesied son of David had arrived. They recognized Jesus, but their words never indicate that they understood what Jesus was up to. The forces of darkness were duped into conspiring to kill Jesus. It was a divinely designed misdirection. Intelligent evil, Satan, demons, the lesser gods, do not know everything. Only God is all-knowing, and he is on our side. On their way to the Promised Land, God gave Israel the law, but Obedience to the law wasn't how Israelites obtained salvation. It was how they showed loyalty to Yahweh. It would help them to live in harmony with God and each other. Salvation in the Bible is the same in either testament. Israelites had to believe God was the God of all gods. He made them to be with him as his family because he loved them. They needed to refuse to worship any other god. Why did Jesus have to die? Why would God plan such a thing? So that his children would have eternal life. That's what Eden was supposed to be. The first supernatural rebellion in Eden brought death into God's world. Everyone was destined to end up in the realm of the dead. 
where the serpent was cast down. Death had to be overcome. That means resurrection, but you can't have a resurrection without a death. But Jesus knew it had to be done. He volunteered for that role. He would die in our place, rise again, and overcome death. God wants us to believe in his plan. He never gave up on including humans in his family. That's why Jesus came. There was no plan B. The Bible asks us to believe a lot of strange things about the spiritual world. At first we might be tempted to ignore them, but if we say we believe the Bible, we can't avoid these concepts. Much of what we think we know about the spirit world isn't true. It's been filtered down through centuries of church tradition. Angels do not have wings, demons don't have horns or tails. And for the biblical writers, the unseen realm was home to more than angels and demons. There were other, bigger players. So do you believe what's in your Bible?